Okay. Um, I'm here with um, the great Mr. Stephen Bernstein. Um, he is a wonderful director, writer, cinematographer, and we are so appreciative of his time today. Um, yes, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Um, I'd love to start off with what you're doing um, currently. Um, you're in the edi editing process of your latest project. Um, would you like to talk about that? How sure. Yes. Sure. It's it's a crazy time because, um, you know, you always plan a project forward and you should probably always plan a project backwards because that way you know where you're going to end up. So the things we're thinking about, of course, is we're going to do a festival run uh, next year. Cannes coming up, um, Tribeca, which is probably where we'll premiere. So we're now kind of in a, a slightly rushed mode to make sure we finish the film uh, on on time. Um, and the other interesting thing is that my editor, Chris Gill, who's uh, Danny Boyle's uh, editor, Danny Boyle, who did um, Some Dog Millionaire and 28 Weeks Later, etc. But he's such a great editor and he's a friend. He's in the UK. So I'm in Los Angeles. Um, I've just come back from London a month and a half ago. Chris is there editing and we're connecting remotely as he does um, these edits. The project's called uh, GRQ, which stands for Get Rich Quick. It's based on a novel that I wrote uh, last year um, about um, cryptocurrency, having no idea about how topical uh, it would uh, become, and about a guy who gets himself in some financial deep water and figures his way out of it is to invest everything he has in cryptocurrency without telling his wife. So everything there, uh, while well, there's an earthquake in Los Angeles. So <laughs> it's a it's, it's a comic uh, novel, um, now a comic film, but it, it has um, you know, tragic um, underpinnings. Um, and people really like the novel a lot. Um, and that led to uh, cast interest and finance. And then we um, shot the film a couple of months ago, first in Los Angeles, then in London. And now we're, we're editing. Uh, other projects going, um, I've written a new book about the creative process, uh, which comes out next year, which takes all my different experiences in film and theater and writing and cinematography. And I try to distill it into an understanding of how we go from an idea to the expression of that idea, which is creative process. So uh, it's a very long book. I don't know how interesting it is, but it's long. So uh, hopefully by the time it gets uninteresting, people will stop reading it. Uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> and then um, uh, I've, I've got, a, of course, the novella itself, GRQ will be coming out this year as will the film. So. Uh, and then I'm writing a screenplay about, for a TV series in the UK and another one in Spain. So it's, uh, it's busy and um, my imagination about what I'm capable of usually exceeds what I'm actually capable of. So I, I have to see how much I succeed in doing, but it's, it's a busy time. It, it's, it's, yeah, it sounds like it. <laughs> very busy and interesting. Is that kind of, because I think you hit on something um, there. Um, it seems like you have a lot of irons in the fire do you think that's good for productivity because you'll hear some people say oh we'll just focus you know on like the perfectionism of one script or one film at a time so do you kind of um like fly in the face of that convention like maybe it seems I think it's, like a it's a brilliant question because it goes to um uh, my greatest failure as a person as a creative and then also possibly my, my greatest uh, virtue uh, I think you're absolutely right, is that we're best when we're focused on a single thing. So I find, I used to do something very crazy and eccentric. I used to take the train between San Diego and Los Angeles, uh, but never getting off. I'd, I'd go one end, but I'd get up and I'd take the train back. Because if you turn off your cell phone and you're traveling, you're singularly focused on your creative work. Also, um, you'll find the last week of pre-production before a film, the last day of shooting, suddenly you're focused because you recognize it's like packing for a trip, you got to leave the next day. You suddenly realize exactly what you have to put in the bag. And uh, that's, I realize what I have to put in my creative uh, bag. So in one sense, you're absolutely right. That singular focus is great because uh, you, things become clear to you that wouldn't be clear if you're doing a great many other things. But um, the opposite of that is also true. When I do my first draft of a screenplay, um, I write extremely quickly without an outline, without a plan, four days, dictating usually rather than writing onto a recorder. 
um, and then uh, incorporating everything I can think of in what is absolutely a chaotic process. But for me, all things have to begin in chaos. And then once I've articulated it or written it or expressed it, it begins to acquire a form uh, that it didn't have beforehand. So singular focus, um, going back to like the idea of Plato, the, you know, the idea of divine form, that form exists before an idea does. I think the other way around. I think everything is chaos. And until we express something, it doesn't acquire a form. So I find it difficult to plan because I don't know what I'm planning because I haven't made it yet. So in the end, the hybrid of this is a combination of going completely mad at the beginning, doing everything, and then allowing uh, the fates or um, the uh, creative process or um, the serendipity of uh, the connecting of ideas to reveal to me what is important, what I should be doing, and what finally has to be a singular focus. GRQ began as a stream of consciousness novel, which became a more structured novel, which began as a screen, then became a screen consciousness screenplay, which became a very concise screenplay, which became a very chaotic film pre-production, which then became a very precise film production. So brilliant question. Um, I think this balance between chaos and order, uh, between singular focus and being open to a stimulation um, is what um, being a creative artist is about. And it's a constant struggle that probably never finishes. Wow. That, yeah, that's, that's really deep. And it, it really, it, it speaks to so much of um, what I was saying before we started the interview, just about how much positivity you put out into the world. Like I have to thank you personally um, in the midst of a pandemic you got on Instagram and started teaching you what you know uh, about the creative process and filmmaking. So I just think you're, um, you know, I have to thank you. Like you made the time in lockdown, you know, so much more um, bearable. And <laughs> so I have to thank you. I'm sure everybody that has seen those videos, uh, thank you. And I remember you brought up um, your slop draft, um, uh, theory and how yeah. you work that way. So, yeah. I was just talking to a writer the other day who had writer's block, and I said the best way over writer's block is don't write well. Uh, dedicate yourself to writing the poorest screenplay or book or poem or novel that you possibly can. And if you wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to write, and not only it might it be bad, I hope it's bad, I'm just going to write because the process is more important than the result, it liberates you. And once you're liberated, you find that through expression, you discover ideas. Um, and I think that's essential. I mean, I overstate the case when I say write badly, but um, you know, Joan Didion um, said she writes to find out what she knows. And I think that's true of all writers and thinkers. Uh, we express, not to express what we know already, but to discover what we might know or that we do know, but so buried in the recesses of our uh, conscious mind or unconscious mind that we have to try to give it a form of, uh, so we can understand it or access it. Um, and as for you know, what I did over the pandemic, what I do generally, uh, the great thing about me is I'm a deeply flawed person. Um, I failed in every possible way. Uh, I've suffered much, I've, I've had much and I lost much. And the advantage of that um, is that you become empathic because rather than seeing everyone as a competitor or as an enemy, uh, you see them as a, a fellow traveler, um, another person on the same journey that you are on. So when I think, um, when I was lost, how I had a few mentors who gave me uh, some advice and how that rescued me. I ultimately followed my own path, but only because I knew that there was a path there to follow. And when I heard from other people who also failed and had difficulties and you know put everything they had in a film and didn't do well, um, wrote a screenplay that didn't sell, um, you know, what got into controversy, whatever it is we have, the things we, we suffer in life in film, you then realize that what is of most value, the greatest virtue, is your own individual resilience, uh, your ability to soldier on, and most of all, uh, to believe in an uncertain future. Um, the, you know, the problem with the, the other great joke is how do you make God laugh, uh, make a plan? But I, I, I think that's kind of true, is that you can only plan based on what you already know. But the future is full of things 
that you have no way of knowing or comprehending. Um, so many different things can happen. And I didn't know I'd write about that subject. I never heard of cryptocurrency four years ago. Ah. Uh, so uh, that's, that's that's why I reached out to people, and and I, you know I'm glad to hear people liked it, and those are some value, and um, I I gave some comfort to people, and in, in what was a difficult uh, difficult time. In in speaking um, about your process, like I'm sure um, being a great director, other um, up and coming directors might want to know about your casting process. Um, would you like to discuss that a bit? Like, do you ever like write something you automatically know oh, this is for so and so? Um, you know, how does that go for you generally? Well, I, I think that it's very interesting because it's both a combination of producing and directing the casting process. Um, because you, at least in America, if you're going to sell a film, um, you, you want to cast that it's known because you have a better, like a higher likelihood of seeing revenue back if you've got a known cast. Um, also, uh, I feel that casting is a bit like writing and that until you meet the right cast, you don't know who the right cast is. So what I do is I cast great casting director. Get great casting directors. Um, uh, the one of two films ago was Mary Venu, who was probably the best cast director in the world. Uh, Alison Estrin, who cast my last film, is another great one. Um, and they stimulate me and introduce me to people that uh, I might not even be thinking of. Someone they've seen in the theater or a play, uh, um, someone um, who they may have seen over an independent movie um, or a TV show. I can't see everything. I try to see as much as I can, and then when I see somebody I really like or interesting, I write down, find out who their agents or managers are, and file them away. Uh, but when I write, um, I imagine the, the characters, but I don't imagine uh, the actor. Uh, and then once the actor gets involved, the character then uh, changes and evolves into something else. So the great example is uh, my friend John Malkovich. Um, uh, when I wrote um, Dominion, um, uh, called Last Call in some places, um, about the last days of Dylan Thomas, starring Reese Stephans, a great Welsh actor. Um, first of all, everyone was amazed that I cast Reese because they said he looked nothing like uh, Dylan Thomas. I'm not concerned about who looks like whom. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned about who can deliver um, the emotional arc that I want. Uh, and then as for John, um, I talked to him a great deal about the backstory of the Dylan Thomas's doctor. And he and I began talking about people we knew about the sensibility, about the backstory. He then came back to me with some additional story, a backstory, I came back to him with some additional backstory, and the character evolved uh, and was different than what I wrote originally, uh, similar, certainly, and uh, was true to the integrity of the vision and the script, but different. Uh, and John is brilliant. So ultimately, the collaboration provided uh, my ability, provided the film this ability to access more minds than one and to become better than it initially was. So when I cast, um, I bring actors in and I talk to them about art and philosophy, about what they've been reading, about personal experiences they've had, where they are emotionally, um, what traumas they've had, what joys they've had, what they believe in, um, their acting process as a general principle, but very rarely and almost never about the script itself. Uh, because I'm not interested in someone doing a reading for me and demonstrating uh, they get the notes that I want them to hit. I want to find a creative collaborator who I can exchange ideas with, uh, decide on a vision together, and arrive at that vision by the application of our individual skills. Wow. <laughs> There's so much there. Yeah, you can you can see, you know, the actor embodying the character rather than just have it be, you know, notes on a page and and yeah. can bring their whole being into something like that rather than, you know, yeah. these are the what I have written, the words I've written and that's what I want. And yeah, well that's it's, it's, it's so fascinating what we're getting at here is because um what happens, let's presume that I'm right and the world is chaos, the universe is chaotic, everything is chaos. But there's millions of ideas and principles and um, uh, cross-germinating uh, things that all mediate and, and each other. Uh, but there's no particular form to it. What we do so we don't go mad, because the embracing of that chaos would drive us crazy. 
we begin to immediately edit and limit things. We won't think about this. We won't cons uh, consider this thing possible. We will believe that there's a God in heaven, which you're allowed to believe in, and God has ordered the world so the virtuous are rewarded uh, and malfeasance is, is punished. Um, we will believe that in capitalism, that if we work hard, we'll, we'll be paid a great deal of money. We'll believe in the fairness and judgment of others, that if we make a good film, they'll look at it and they'll recognize it and we'll be rewarded. And each time we're limiting the world so it becomes narrow, small, and structured and safe. But is that the actual experience of the totality of the chaos of the universe that's around us? So for me, limiting um, limits and limits us creatively to stay open to different actors, uh, different ideas, uh, different um, uh, applications of concepts, different philosophies. That is what you've got to do for as long as you possibly can do. And then ultimately you finish in limits, but you don't begin there. And a, great, a great example of this is when you write uh, characters. Almost all writers can write a character with a scene with one character or with two, a uh, simple dialogue. But when you start writing scenes with four or five or six characters, which, by the way, to all the writers listening, is always a better scene, it, it really damages the mind because you've got to get all these characters speaking, they're having their through lines, um, their agendas. Um, their relationships with other people in the room, and the scenes become magical and genuine because this is the way we experience and mediate the world, but they're really hard to write. So what do most writers do? They write dialogue scenes, not scenes with the five people because it's too difficult. They are limiting themselves by not being open to the chaos of what might be a better experience. But then when you see a film like The Triangle of Sadness, you have all these scenes with four, five, six characters, and they're brilliantly wrought. So that's what I mean about uh, chaos and, and order and um, how we have to be open to not what we think we want, but what we might discover. It's amazing you're, you're talking about philosophy and just in talking to you because, um, you know, you could have a, a totally different attitude. You've been on some amazingly successful um, films, you know, and you could have this, you know... <laughs> But, you know, and what I what I get in speaking to you is um, from the Tao, even the rivers keep themselves low so the ocean can feed them. They know that the ocean will. Fantastic. Feed them. Exactly right. And, and look, you talk about success. You know, success is a strange thing as you get older. Uh, first, you think it's material. So, yeah, I had some material success, bought an airplane here in Los Angeles, um, had a boat, the whole the whole. And that, but I wasn't happy. Uh, then I worked on SWAT, 23 cameras, crashing airplanes. Um, Samuel Jackson, huge movie, and I've never been so depressed. Uh, and I think the reason for that is that the only thing worse than not getting what you want is getting what you want and finding yourself unchanged. So I was sitting on the, uh, the Second Street Bridge in downtown Los Angeles. We were crashing an airplane. We were blowing things up. We had giant Moscow lights. And everything as a boy that I dreamed of a film set would be like doing a studio movie. Uh, and it wasn't edifying. It wasn't satisfying. And then, um, as we say, we don't know what's coming. We don't know what order is going to be presented to us. I got a phone call um, from a very small independent film shooting in Florida. They had no money. They're going to pay me about 1 20th of what I was getting on SWAT. I couldn't have all my cameras. It was a first-time director, always a disaster. Um, and movie actress that was pretty, but no one had really heard of. Um, and would I come down and shoot the film? And I liked the script. The actress seemed interesting to me, and the, the director, even though she's a first-timer, was really nice and interesting. So I gave up all the money, and I went to do this awful, low-budget little film in Florida, and that film was Monster, which went on to win the Oscar. So, <laughs> you know, um, sometimes um, there is order, and it was as if the fates were saying, yes, yeah, Stephen, you're making a lot of money on SWAT, but it, and, and by the way, bless everybody on that film, and I love them all, and they're dear friends, and I, I'm glad that film was also successful, but um, sometimes uh, you look for something else besides just money. Money's great, gives stability and, and security, but you also want to have something that edifies, where you feel, 
I've done something important. I've changed the fabric of this chaos. And, and what art does is it provides that order, which I think is absent. Language does that, it structures chaos. Poetry does it, a novel does it. And a film takes a little piece of the world and says, maybe this is the way the world works, at least for these characters, or maybe for all of you. And in that way, it's sacred. Wow. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, this has been amazing. And I, I wanted to touch on Monster and it came up um, organically, which is great too. You know, the um, ethos of our um, film festival is the collaboration, gender equality. Um, so, you know, I just like how profound is, is that, that, you know, you had a first time director um you're, you're leaving you know all the trappings of success let's say and you make something that's going to stand well, the test of time you want to talk about gender talk about patty jenkins who's one of the most remarkable people i've ever worked with um and patty was on her first film um just out of the afi had done some camera assisting work but really was not yet a feature film director um but she had a combination of two uh, essential um, um, uh, characteristics, bits of character. Um, she was extremely strong. So, um, but she does it in a very quiet, almost zen-like way. So when the producers were pushing her to compromise her vision of the film, um, she'd just say very quietly, no. And they would say, you're a first time director, we gave you this money. And she would say, no. Famously, we had a sequence to do on a road when Christina Ricci and, and Charlie Theron were falling in love and they were driving down a car and it was a long, beautiful uh, dialogue sequence which uh, Patty wrote. Um, and they got us a very short road. Now, when you shoot with cars, you put them on a truck and the truck's enormous and it pulls the car along and the lights are on in the camera. To turn this thing around would take 15 minutes. We'd get like three minutes of dialogue and we'd be at the end of the road and we'd have to turn around again. It wasn't working and Patty said, we gotta go to another road. The producer said, we can't afford it. And Patty said, well, then we're not shooting. And they said, yes, you are. You're our employee. She said, no, I'm not. And she instructed me to sit down. I sat down and I followed her instructions. And we waited. And we waited three hours until they found us another road. We got the long road and we shot one of the best scenes in the film because of her, her strength. Right after Monster winning the Oscar um, and the Golden Globe, uh, they offered her every type of film imaginable. Now, Here's the dream being presented to her, but she was more mature and thoughtful and wise than I was. And she said no to everything. I mean, mm -hmm. everything until the project came along, which she felt was a representation of women, particular interests of hers, as strong, as independent, as forceful, um, at the same time, you know, reach a broad audience and have integrity. And she directed Wonder Woman and Wonder Woman 2, whether you like them or not, uh, I just goes to uh, Patty's uh, integrity of vision before, um, there was a lot of support in the community uh, for women directors. There weren't very many around when she was uh, doing that. So a remarkable story. And same thing with uh, Charlize. It's about um, individual uh, empowerment in the face of, uh, uh, you know, an oligarchy in Hollywood. It's very hard to buck, but they did it. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. I think that's a um, wonderful um, place to um, end our interview for today. Unless that's... you have any um, parting words. Um, no. I, well, just I... Don't quit. Uh, keep doing it. If you want to make a film, the best way to make one is just to keep going. Don't presume that if you have a setback, you're going to fail. Uh, don't presume that anyone else knows film better than you do. Uh, don't let a bad review or rejection by an actor or a producer or director uh, ever dissuade you, just keep uh, soldiering uh, forth. And believe most of all in chaos. Don't over plan, don't sit down and think every word has to be perfect when you're writing a screenplay, because you'll never write more than a page. Write badly at length, go back and edit, and I promise you, you'll have a screenplay. That's it. Well, I, I hope we are all fortunate to work with you one day. Just, uh. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, and follow you on Instagram um and keep up on all your films and books and i just yeah, yeah. thank you oh and, and on instagram it's stephen bernstein director writer um and as you know and others might i post um every day and it's not like here i am at the beach here i am um, you know, <laughs> it's always about uh, here's what i learned today from making the film and what i'm posting about now is the post-production uh, process on uh, 
on GRQ, which comes out next year. So uh, people who are interested can look back on the earlier um, talks that I gave about how the film was made. Each day I would come back and talk about my experience with the actors that day and the set. Now they'll be able to follow it all the way through the editing, the post-production, the sound mix, the digital intermediate, right through the film festivals and release. So I want people to be able to experience the whole journey of making a film from beginning to end um, and then go see the movie and say, oh, I know how this was made. So that's my, that's my dream. Oh, brilliant. Such a gift. Such a gift. <laughs> the movie behind the movie. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. What? Ciao. Um, good luck thank with everything. Thank you so much. Thank no. you. And with you, thank you so much for your time today. Thank my you. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Really